All right. Good morning, first of all. Good morning. All right. <clears throat> it's been a minute. Yeah. It's, yes. Wow. This thing has really taken us out of life, I swear. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's what we got. That's the cards we have. Yeah. Uh, have you been playing much? I know you just said that you were uh, doing a recording session. Yeah, I was I was on a recording with uh, Brandon Marcellus, mm -hmm. and I've been doing some, oh, the Preservation Hall Band, you know, where I worked for many, many years, um, have made me some kind of legend, I don't know. I don't know if it's just a euphemism for old. <laughs> <laughs> Or exactly what it is but um i did a little recording for them and they're gonna put some pictures the four seasons bought the old um international trademark building mm -hmm. and um they're gonna be some pictures of musicians in there and i happen to be one of the lucky ones that they picked to cool. be part of that yeah it's nice what you been up to? What have you been practicing, sharing, just studying yeah, all well, of the above? Yeah, I'm going to UNO now, and I'm studying with Ashlyn Parker. Um, so I've been pretty Ooh. busy with school. Great, great, great. Um, next month, I have a, a, a virtual teaching thing with Ashlyn and um, John uh, Michael. Oh, great, yeah. Yeah, so that's going to... You got almost three generations of something there going on, you know. They they're pretty close in, in age. I don't I don't know how old anybody is, but uh, I know I'm gonna be the old man of the group. <laughs> well, great. Um, I just wanted to ask you a few questions, and then maybe we could play a little bit of trumpet, uh, or we could just talk. Of course. Uh, Okay, um, so yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about your background. Can you tell me about growing up in a musical family here in New Orleans? Oh man, what a, you know, you don't realize what an opportunity that is until you, you, you know, when they say youth is wasted on the young, that's very, very true in many ways. But, um, you know, my daddy was a great musician and went to Juilliard and a very smart guy. He graduated high school when he was 15 years old and skipped a couple of grades. So he held us to some pretty high uh, scholastic standards. And um, my older brother, John, was a killer trumpet player, man. Killer. So I grew up hearing some great trumpet around the house and great music. My daddy wrote a lot of the music for Cap Calloway and Billy Eckstein and people like that. So um, I was exposed to a lot of different things. And just being born in New Orleans is such an advantage. Um, not everybody's taking advantage of that, you know, being born in New Orleans. But I was the era I came up in, in the like late 60s and 70s, there was great, great music on Bourbon Street. Great trumpet players. My dad, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Wallace Davenport, people like that. Man, it was just such a such an experience to go out there. And uh, not to go out there with the attitude, like, hey, old man, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to clean you out. Never anything like that. It was always a humbling experience to go... Um, to see those guys and to hear them. And each one of them had something different. And Preservation Hall had started, and then there was the next, another place called Dixieland Hall. And <clears throat> there were just great bands in New Orleans at that time. And there was tons to learn. And um, if you took advantage of it, especially, it was just such a wonderful thing. Um, like I started, I got to blow on the mouthpiece, you know, I have a lot of records from my daddy and Dave Bartholomew and people like that. And, um, 
So when I was about seven or so, they just kind of blowing on the mouthpiece with a, you know, you know that uh, kind of little straight part of the Harmon mute. Mm -hmm. I put yeah. my mouthpiece in that and make a little wah wah out of that. <laughs> I didn't know the notes on the trumpet. But um, when I was about 10, 10 or 11, I got to seventh grade and that's where I really started learning a little bit about the horn, how to read and, you know, that G is that note and F is, a, you know, those kinds of things like that. And it was, um, I didn't realize how big that hill was, you know, in front of me, but um, it's been a really wonderful life. Uh, I've toured everywhere, knew some really, really great people. And um, it's, anyway, it's just, it's just been, uh, I feel very blessed and lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when did you know that you really wanted to be a trumpet player? Hmm. When I was 15, I started playing in garage bands and stuff like that. And uh, I had... We played a lot of the music from Blood, Sweat, and Tears and mm -hmm. Chicago with uh, just, um, the Tower of Power and mm -hmm. all of those kinds of bands, you know. And that's when I really started getting interested in that I really wanted to try to learn to play the trumpet because mm -hmm. it was exciting, you know, it was real exciting, you were growing, and um, you just felt uh, there was so much more to learn, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of when I really thought I could, but I, my, one of my first loves was baseball, so I had to prove to myself that I wasn't a professional baseball player first. Mm -hmm. I went to a little camp, and um, there were some really great players there, so I, I was, um, I didn't make it. I, after about two and a half, three weeks, I, they thought, um, I think we could miss you and, uh, <laughs> and still do well. So then I came back home and uh, I had a little scholarship to Xavier and stuff like that, and that had gone away because that was a summer um, time thing to go to this baseball camp. So I, I, went, I wound up going to Delgado mm -hmm. and I just stayed there. I got an AA degree there. Then I went to Southern University at night because by this time I was playing some gigs and stuff like that. So uh, it was just um, my career was kind of taking off and um, it's just got to do what you got to do. You know how it works. Um, so could you tell me, um, what, what did you learn from playing with Lionel Hampton's band? Oh man. First day I was, I was sleeping one morning and the phone rang. <clears throat> hey Wendell. Hey, it's Wallace Davenport. Hey man, how you doing? He said, look, I got a gig for you if you want it. I said, well, okay. I said, what is it? He said, so playing with the Lionel Hampton band. We're playing on the president tonight. We need a, an extra trumpet player. What? Man, he said, look, we have rehearsal at, you know, 12 o'clock and the gigs at nine or whatever. So, well, okay, well, you know. So, showed up on the, it was the SS president boat back then. It used to be, this is before you were born. A long time ago. And, I mean, I showed up there, Wallace Davenport, Joe Newman, and Jimmy Maxwell. Those were the other three trumpet players, my God. And I always say this, but I swore what they were playing was not on my paper, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just like, wow, that was such a humbling experience. And Teddy Wilson was on piano, and uh, I think Oliver Jackson played drums on that first gig, and you know, like on that cob and people like that. My God, man, people I'd only heard of. And here I was sitting in the section behind them, Al Gray, Curtis Fuller, people like, oh my Lord. 
I didn't feel worthy, you know, but um, I was there. So uh, it was like, hmm, anyway, that was a very humbling experience. And to hear those guys play those parts like that, and Wallace Davenport was a lead playing son of a gun, man. Mm -hmm. You know, on that, like, luck be a lady tonight, and all those basic things with Sinatra, it's Wallace playing lead trumpet on that. Wow. And, wow. you know, fly me to the moon. And we've all cried trying to hit those notes, you know. And uh, it was, um, so that that's one thing I learned. Didn't realize I had learned it, but that it was a journey and not somewhere you arrive at. Mm -hmm. You know, that the whole artist thing is a journey. And if you... You know, I always say if if you're not getting better, you're probably getting worse. You know, so you got to keep practicing and working to get better and better, and just learning more. And you know, like listening to the forefathers and the people that um, influence us. Just there's so much in listening to Blue Mitchell and Lee Morgan and. Of course, Clifford Brown, Louis Armstrong, Roy Eldridge, Diz, and all of these guys, man, those cats had done some works that we didn't have to do. Mm -hmm. You had to do it to learn to do it. But they had it from the grassroots, you know? And that was um, that whole humbling experience there was just amazing. <laughs> At one of the first jazz festivals around 1970, Dizzy Gillespie came here. And I went to the thing. Well, the jazz festival was much, much smaller and much more personal back then. So my dad had, you know, everybody knew my daddy. So we could just walk in the jazz fest at the municipal auditorium. Um, Dizzy Gillespie was there, Mahalia Jackson. As a matter of fact, I grew up with her niece. Um, a girl named Mona. Anyway, she's a great gospel singer also. But um, talking to Dizzy Gillespie, because my dad had taken, you know, they had this spitball thing with Dizzy Gillespie where he shot a spitball. Mm -hmm. and, and then he hired my dad to play trumpet after that, Cap Calloway hired my dad. And um, anyway, we, I was just talking to Dizzy Gillespie, hanging around like, whoa, man, in awe of Diz. And um, Dizzy Gillespie told me this, and I've heard many people quote this, but I'm, I think I'm one of the few people that really believe it, because, um, like I said, I've heard many people quote it. But he told me, he said, man, remember, he said, Bird told me this. He said, Keep one foot in the future and keep one foot in the blues. Mm -hmm. You know, so all of those classes you came to, where that's why it was so accentuating upon the blues, because it gives you a feeling and an individual feeling. And that's the magic, because I don't know what kind of blues you had today, or it's very early. Maybe you haven't had experienced anything, but yesterday, you had a blues and the sink got stopped up. I had a headache. All of those are individual blueses. And I could have gotten a flat tire or, you know, got bitten by a dog or whatever. That All of those are your individual blues, and it gives your playing individuality and character. So that was an important statement to me when Dizzy Gillespie said that, and I was like, Wow. And when he said Charlie Parker had told him that, that even made it a little more important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's a philosophy of mine. And um, many, I think many people kind of can identify with it, but a lot of younger people have been given all of this you know, like modern scales and stuff like that to deal with. And um, it keeps you from accentuating upon your blues and your feeling. 
Because when I say blues, I don't mean just one, four, five blues. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about the heart that it takes and the individuality that it takes to play that particular song. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember you mentioned that you got to spend some time with Chuck Baker. Can you talk mm -hmm. about that a bit? We had the same agent. Mm -hmm. A guy named Vim Vick in, in um, Wageningen, in a little city in Holland. He had timeless records also. I had recorded for them. And um, <clears throat> just to be around Chet Baker, and Vim would send me there, just, he said, man, you know, Chet was kind of a loose cannon, you know, great trumpet player, great singer, but just loose as a goose, man, you know, and, and I would just go there and sit and listen to Chet Baker, and sometimes his chops weren't right. You know, he, he had a tough life. He had he lived some tragic things that uh, hopefully none of us ever encounter in life. But it was just so amazing to sit there, and all of those records I'd heard throughout the years was playing right in front of me, um, you know, for real, that was, he, he hadn't, um, like I said, his chops were not real tight and stuff like that, but I'd heard him play, man. I'd heard him do all of those, um, you know, the best thing for you is me and all of these kinds of beautiful things and heard him sing time after time and, you know, because I'd, I'd been to a couple of concerts of his before I got to even, you know, go there. And he he was pretty nice, he, you know. He was a, just kind of spaced out a lot of times. But boy, it was just such an honor just to be, breathe the same air as Chad Baker. <laughs> he was, oh man, I just love this playing and I love this singing. And his blues came out, you know, because <clears throat> he wasn't a real, like, um, kind of like me, like more of a self-taught musician. I mean, we did some study, but his his artistry just came from his heart rather than his brain, mm -hmm. you know. And that's one thing I loved about him and admired most of all. Hmm. Um. Who who are some of your other favorite trumpet players, more specifically in the city, too? In this in in New Orleans? Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> Herlin Riley had an uncle named Melvin Lasty, mm -hmm. who's a more of a funk trumpet player. You know, mm -hmm. he, he, YouTube him, man. He just played funky work with Willie Bobo. And he did that solo on I Know. Mm -hmm. And boy, everybody wanted to learn that solo. I did an interview a couple of years ago with Gwen Tompkins, and I was explaining to her how I Know <clears throat> was about the same form as Just a Closer Walk With Thee. And she was like, what? You know, and you know, just, I was like, yeah. So anyway, that, to me, that solo, Harold Baptiste actually wrote the solo. Mm -hmm. And I talked to Harold, you know, because I was at UNO a few years. Um, and Harold said, man, I just wrote what I thought Melvin was going to play. <laughs> you know, it wasn't no big thing. I just wrote what I thought Melvin was going to play. And it was, um, that, that's an important solo to me. Of course, my dad and my brother, they were, we were in the same house, man. I could listen to my brother practice Flight of the Bumblebee and all of those really tough solos that I still can't play till today. Um, I mean, just being around my dad and trying to pick out little things on the piano and my dad would be in the kitchen, you know, cutting onions and cooking. And then, no, no, wait, 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 Punkin. No, 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 no. You see your ring finger on your right hand? Bring that down a half step, you know, he had these kind of, you know, just being around that stuff I can do now. I mean, 
that was like, wow. You know, how, how do you get that knowledge? How do you learn to do that? Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, just being around that stuff. There was another guy named Thomas Jefferson who was a killer, man. He, he could just swing his butt off. He just swung so hard. And I got to play a few parades with him. And uh, in one parade, it was my brother John, myself, Thomas Jefferson, and Roland Kirk came, brought his soprano, and walked along with us. Had his friend or wife, somebody holding his arm so he wouldn't walk into anybody, but playing, because Roland Kirk loved uh, Albert Burbank and people like that. Because mm -hmm. we went to Preservation Hall and um, that night, because I was so inspired, and Albert Burbank was playing the clarinet, who was a guy I knew growing up, friends with my daddy. And, um, uh, Rashad and Roland Kirk sitting there listening to Albert Burbank just and he played a very simple style and you know like do 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 it just was just simple but Roland Kirk was like wow that's that's coming from somewhere I don't know you know he didn't know where exactly where that was coming from but he was like that, that stuff from the islands, man. You know, he would say stuff like that. And it was like so important growing up around these kind of people and paying attention. Wallace Davenport was another great trumpet player that influenced me. Um, he, like I told you, he got me the gig with Hamp. Because after I got that one gig, and about three months later, Hamp manager called me up. So Wallace called me up. They had called Wallace. Hey man, who said what's that boy that played with me on down there in New Orleans? You know? Oh yeah, yeah. So Hamp called, I mean, Wallace called me. Hey man, look, Hamp called me inquiring about you. Want you to come to New York. He said, look, go. I don't care what kind of money they offer you. That's experience and lessons you can't buy, man. So he said, so I said, okay. So I told him. Um, Bill Titone. I said, well, yeah, I'll take the key. So it was about two weeks before I had to go up to New York. So Wallace called me up. Hey, man, look, come, come on over here. He lives not far from here in Gen Gentilly. And um, he had books. He had a first and second book. So he said, look, let's, let's, let's go over this, um, some of these, you know, just, just to get you more in a reading vein, you know, because Anyway, that's what I needed to do to sit in that chair. And um, so he started off, and every day I'd go there for about two or three hours, and we'd play. I started playing second trumpet, and then he'd say, no, 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 you play, you play lead today. And, you know, just to play lead trumpet in front of Wallace having Fort Lord today <laughs> was very humbling, but it was all part of the growing process. And... I had a cousin named Harold Dejan, who was the leader of the Olympia Brass Band. So I got to play with them a lot. And um, I was very, very lucky. And then, you know, what they say, luck is where preparation meets opportunity. And um, I had done some preparation. And when those opportunities came along, you realize how much preparation you still had to do. Mm -hmm. So, um, just 1976, or well, 75, I was just 20, I was just barely 20. Uh, Papa French, George French's daddy, they called my dad, hey, hey, pick it. I, you know, I got this gig, and you know. And my daddy was, oh, Papa, I'm sick, man. He said, well, I'll send my son. So Papa said, oh, okay. Thank you. He was talking about John, my brother. You know? <laughs> anyway, I put on my best suit. And I had my big, big hairdo back then. And um, when I showed up on the gig, Papa looked, oh, my God. He said, who are you, man? 
I said, well, I'm Pickett, son. It, oh, my God, he's a man. Oh, we thought he was going to send John. Well, needless to say, his self-esteem can go pretty, even below zero at that point, you know. So then he did a wonderful thing for me, Emily. He said, I tell you what, you're my band leader tonight. Whatever you call, that's what we're going to play. And, you know, every now and then I'll play one, you know, because you get like a six-piece band. Trumpet better know the lead. You better know the lead. So, I mean, I had a bunch of standards I'd worked on, but a lot of that New Orleans repertoire, I had, I, um, wasn't, I was familiar with it, but I'd never played it. So anyway, I've been around that stuff. You know, I did, I did a record when I was nine years old, singing with my daddy. I'd heard that music all my life, and I had a pretty decent ear. Anyway, I did okay. And Papa, at the end of that um, night, he said, oh, man, you did pretty good. He said, now, look, I want you to learn more tunes now. Huh? Oh, yeah, okay. So... Went home that night, man, I was like, I had the bug there for real, you know. I had the music bug. And next morning, I called up Harold Desjean. I said, hey, Duke, man, you got any books with tunes that I can learn from? So he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll bring you something tomorrow. So he brought me two books written in concert. We didn't have all the apps and all that kind of stuff they got now. And a pot of squirrel gumbo. <laughs> That's New Orleans. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Harold spoke in a very broken, you know, he came from an era like my dad, but they spoke a lot of French. So he spoke in a real broken dialect. And uh, anyway, bro, he brought those books. And I transcribed those books to my key by hand with the words, and they had some batch chords in it too, just not real great chords, but anyway, basic, very basic chords. And um, that was, so a lot, a lot of times people talk about how many songs I know and stuff like that, but I attribute that to that. Um, writing all those tunes by hand, because mm -hmm. by the time you write it, you almost know it, you know? Mm -hmm. And all the words that, you know, and I was young and could retain a lot of information back then. So um, that became like a, a real like um, hinge point in my whole life and career. Mm -hmm. Just it, it, within, a week, I had just about written that whole book. I was that inspired, you know? Because mm -hmm. the next weekend, Papa French had another gig that he hired me. So I had to go there and show something, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, um, my uncle was Lester Santiago, and I had a bunch of the records with him, with Paul Barberin, and, mm -hmm. and my daddy, and Kid Howard, and Willie Humphrey, and all these people, you know? All people who I, admired and were like accomplished musicians and you know anyway that was that proved to be very very beneficial to me and my career you know i, I didn't get a lot of, of this uh stuff like they like they playing now and all of this impressive stuff but when I was a teenager, I used to try to play like Menor Ferguson, you know, so I was squeaking on a lot of high notes, and man, I, I loved that stuff. When I was about 15, a cousin of mine, Johnny Fernandez, I don't know if you ever heard of him, he's a great trumpet player, great trumpet teacher. He brought me a record, Clifford Brown with Strings. He said, man, make this your summer project. Learn every note on here. That was another humbling, great lesson. I would kind of home, come home from school, I'd lay on the sofa and put on the record, took a drama with strings. 
and doze off to sleep. I mean, it was hot in New Orleans, and um, we didn't have air conditioning back then. So it was just very warm. But I'd go to sleep listening to Clifford Brown with string. And my mother would come in there. As a man blowing his head off, and you're sleeping, you know, not realizing that you're really absorbing in your sleep, you know? So, I mean, in this whole artistry, it's so important, like, the, you are what you eat, you know? So, when I was just 11, even before that, I walked to the Circle Food Store. You know where it is, huh? Mm -hmm. Cleveland and St. Bernard. Yeah. I walked yes. there from my house, 1955 North County. And in the pharmacy department, they had a little record rack. And I saw a record, Lee Morgan. I didn't know who he was. I was like, hmm. and it was cut off. One of the edges was cut off. This was a discount thing. I think it was a dollar ninety nine. And I bought that record. And, you know, I think it was called Candy was the name of the record. And on that, Lee Morgan played the song all the way. Man, when I heard that, I, I wanted to be a balladeer from then on. I was like, whew, whew. just the sound. And then I discovered he had done Blue Train and all of these kinds of things, you know. But from that, and he did, oh, he did so many beautiful songs on their personality and the phrasing. I would say, wow, you know, and that element of blues was in there that I valued so much, you know, and it might have been some of the things that sparked my blues admiration. I mean, from, I was about 11 when I, when I went to the circle, I got that record. And um, that kind of stuff just, then I started checking out Blue Mitchell with Horace Silver and Donald Byrd, of course, Miles Davis, you know. And the first time I heard like um, Dr. Jekyll, I was like, what the heck is that, man? You know, it's like, I think Jackie McLean actually wrote the song. But boy, Miles played, played so beautifully on that record. I was like, wow. And it was very different from Clifford Brown and, and Lee Morgan, Blue Mitchell. You know, he was going into his modal thing then, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, um, so that was, you know, that, that thing was changing a bit. I still love that kind of 60s kind of trumpet. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but then the bitches brew came up. And he did a thing on there called Nemun Talvez and it was just like, what, what is that? You know, it was just so like, it, it was very new at that time. And no, it didn't, didn't have the, you know, the, the, the whole Lydian concept thing going on. It was somewhere it's totally else. And I was like, wow. And, you know, and all of those things he did with like Herbie Hancock and, you know, it's like, shoo, man, what is that? So that started another growth and, you know, something that aroused your 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 um, artistic spirit. Like, what is that? How, you know, and um, anyway, about 1973 or 74, I'd just gotten out of high school. I was just turned 18. And Lou and Charlie's opened up a, a club on Rampart Street, Rampart and Ursuline. I think it's Ursuline, Ursuline or Domain, right there. And Ellis had a band there, Ellis Marcellus. My brother played trumpet, Ralph Johnson. 
Julius Farmer played bass and James Black. Man. Boy, and everybody was, you know, in their young 30s. But man, those cats were at the top of their game, you know? John was just such a great trumpet player, high note chops. Just, you know, they had so much stuff there. I was like, wow. How could I ever do that, you know? Anyway, um, I was so lucky to be around that kind of stuff and to get to hear that close up in person and just respect the people that were playing it and what they were playing. And that's one of the magical parts of growing, just the respect that, you know, I mean, years ago, um, Ellis and Steve used to work together and they hired me on a couple of things where we played trio and we did, did a lot of great stuff, challenging music, a lot of, um, a lot of Gershwin and Irvin Berlin, Harris Silver, you know, just combining those because just, it was like, whew, boy, that was something, man, just, again, lucky just to have been part of that, you know, then, like, Astro Project came out, and they, they had a definite statement they were making, and we started playing at Tyler's, and, you know, with, with Miss Basil, and just lucky once again, just to, you know, be able to be around that stuff and be part of it, get kept and get paid. Imagine that. But it was um, just, boy, it's such a more of a blessing to be from New Orleans and be around the New Orleans musicians and the New Orleans concept. Because, yes, we had the Lewis on Throne, King Oliver, way back version. But then, as my dad and Jack Willis and people like that came up, and they were more like educated musicians could write, and play more arrangements, like, you know, Jack had been the trumpet player of Ray Charles for many years, and, you know, my daddy had done the whole Billy Eckstein stuff, and Cap Calloway, J. McShane, you know, with Bird in the band, my daddy was in the band with Bird, wow. and just, to, whew, that's lucky, man. That is so lucky. It's just so amazing that um, I got to hear stuff like that and still kept trying to grow, but just still, I still had the things I valued, which were a lot of standards and playing, you know, playing those beautiful melodies because it's just what I like. And we all can do whatever we want to do. We all can do it. But I always thought that that beautiful sound, and once I discovered the flugelhorn, oh man, it's just, um, that was something else. So, just to develop those things, you know, in, in the early days, like people like Eddie Henderson and uh, Art Farmer, Clark Terry, guys, I like, oh man, lucky, very lucky. Um, you mentioned a few albums that uh, you, you really loved. Could you tell me what Louis Armstrong recordings you think are the most important or your favorites? Yes. Um, um, years ago, there was a whole... Um, uh, like a whole thing of records from Louis Armstrong, the Decca Years, I think it was called. And I heard Louis Armstrong do um, "If I Could Be With You," man. And I was like, "Wow, what a great song!" You know the melody, and you know every young guy, just seventeen, eighteen years old, we all Mr. Casanova, 
you know, and those kind of love songs were especially valuable to me and spoke to me the loudest. And then I heard him do this song called When You're Smiling, where he sang it so beautifully. And then he played the melody an octave higher and sustained those notes up the same. Because a lot of times people, you know, because of Louis Armstrong's antics and stuff like that on stage, they thought that was a cover-up for not being able to play the trumpet. But man, he told us all to play. He taught us all to play. And if you don't think so, you're making a mistake. You better check that out. Get with that. So um, that's two of the main things from Louis Armstrong. I was just this morning messing around on my piano, playing this song called If We Never Meet Again. Ah, oh, man. And now I'm, I'm, I'm 65. Now, I have a way I would play that. That's different from Louis Armstrong, an experienced musician for 50 years now, of course. But still, just to check him out, just to check him out doing that tune was, I was like, wow. Hmm. Yeah, of course, Clifford Brown with strings. That whole record has so much information on it, how to sustain notes, how to really play a melody and the tone and how to swell a note and those kinds of things, you know. Um, Horror Silver with Blue Mitchell Man and like Filthy McNasty and all. But that's you and all those guys. You know, and having the New Orleans background, they were playing great. But I had something else I was hearing too. New Orleans, you know, Jacobo feet. You know, I need that kind of stuff. That was all ever, ever present in my ear and in my concept. So, um, just checking out Blue Mitchell. I mean, Donald Bird did a song he called Fly Little Bird Fly. That was a big influence on how chords didn't have to move in fourths, you know? It, it had a, like almost like a diminished chord coming down in there anyway. Things like that, of course, Miles Davis. Um, he never was my favorite, uh, like, uh, ballad player, but he played some of the most interesting intervals and the way he would use things, you know. Mm -hmm. then, uh, then Freddie Hubbard, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, I heard him do, like, Skylark and body and soul and and all the but 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 you know he had speed man I'm saying wow I'm still not up to that speed yet on that tune I've been trying for 40 years man you know and um just um he he did that uh he did so many great great recordings. Woody Shell came out, and I liked Woody. He could play some incredible trumpet. His intervals and the way he used those forts and stuff was just so like, wow. You know? He was also um, one of Vin Vick's uh, clients, the guy who, in Holland. Mm -hmm. He was also one of his guys, him in Dexter Garden. And um, so I, I met him a few times, the great trumpet player. And uh, then, then Winton came out, came, and, and it, you know, that, that was another. So it's, like I say, it's a journey the whole way. When you, you know, Wallace Davenport had this saying, where satisfaction starts, progress stops. Mm -hmm. So the minute you start getting satisfied and complacent, you're in trouble. 
you're in real trouble. Keep working, keep working on it, because it's a journey. And we just got to keep going. And it's a little bit discouraging, and uh, but very gratifying when you overcome these discouragements. Yeah. Um, so I was curious, actually, about... Um your warm-up routine or just general trumpet maintenance um, exercises mm -hmm. that you like to do. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about that or even maybe play a little bit of it if you... Uh, have yes, um, I have a cornet right here in front of me. It's... Um, one thing is I try not to warm up fast because it kind of defeats the purpose, you know? So it's good just to hit a few notes and just let the chops just settle into that, you know? But sometimes you get so enthused, you know, that you want to keep going and yeah. But the slower you warm up, the better it's going to be for you. And I have this thing, it's something that I learned kind of like from Freddie Hubbard. <laughs> And it just gets gets blood flowing in your chops, you know? Mm -hmm. And you're not doing it with any pressure or not trying to even make it a beautiful tone. You're just trying to blow sound and get some vibration and get some blood flowing in your chops. That's um an important <clears throat> element for me, because when your chops are fresh, you think I can hit a couple of high ups, and that's great. Um, <laughs> then what? <laughs> yeah. So it's, you know, but it's um, very, to, to me, all of those things are important. Like, somebody told me that every, every morning, Wallace Davenport, I'm not Wallace Davenport, is the one told me, but Miles used to wake up and play a, song from Louis Armstrong called Potato Head Blues. Mm -hmm. And Miles thought, man, if I could still play Potato Head Blues, I'm still a trumpet player, you know? Yeah. And it's a, that's a weird um, thing to think of, you know, that Miles Davis is like, just had such value for that song, mm -hmm. you know? And, and just but he felt like he could still play the trumpet with all the weird stuff he had done and was doing and all the weird outfits and all that stuff. But man, I still can play potato head blues, bro. You know? And um, it was valuable to him. I think it should be pretty valuable to us too. Because um, just, you know, just, oh boy. It's a journey. I don't see that much. I'm going to try to make this phone stand up a little bit. So maybe I can get two hands on this horn. Mm -hmm. So when I told you about that um, Lee Morgan playing that all the way, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And when you hear that, you can almost hear the words. And that's, that's another part of ballad playing that is important to me, knowing the words. You know, there was uh, Ben Webster. He stopped in the middle of a tune one time recording it, and everybody was like, what, what happened, man? He said, I forgot the words, you know? And I mean, it sounds a little funny or like you want to be something that you're not, but if Ben Webster and all his things that he could do valued the words that much, maybe we should think about that. And, um, you know, it's just like, um, 
so many things of love come through when you're when you play a ballad, you know? It stops being exercises. It starts being something heartfelt. Just me. That's that's just kind of the way I think about it. You know, because all these tunes like P.S. I Love You and songs that were written during World War II when people were so deeply in love and we didn't have a cell phone, we didn't have email, we didn't have, you know, I mean, it might take you three weeks to hear from this person, but you held that dear in your heart, man, that they were thinking of you and you were thinking of them. And, you know, we live very fast now, and that's okay. That's just the world we live in. But that, that's a lot of times why I intend to lean towards the, the ballads, because the words are so like meant for love. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you're learning a new tune, um, w what's your process? So I assume you start with the lyrics and the melody. Um, what, what would you do to get like familiar with <clears throat> playing over a tune? Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty established now, so even if I just got a book and read a song that I've never played before, I would still play it like one Dubronius, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean? It wouldn't be like, da, 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 you know, it wouldn't be, you know, I still would phrase it just, because even as you're just learning it, you're hearing something in there that's your individual interpretation of that particular song. So um, it's just um, so I, I don't think of it in any fixed terms. I just try to play it. It's, if it's a beautiful song, I try to play the words, and um, I try to swing if it's, if it's a tempo song, you know. So. Um, like I did a little arrangement on a song called uh, Love Potion Number Nine in the fifties. Um, a, a group called the Searchers they they recorded that, and um, it was kind of a kooky song, you know. I took my trouble down the mad of Ruth, and so it was it was a kind of kooky song, but then. But I put a I put a bass on ba do boo boo do 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 ba do 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 ba ba do ba do ba do 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 you know because that's the way I was feeling it with swing and with New Orleans and people can put down the concept they want to and it's okay but boy few people. Boom, got that, got that. You know, few, 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 few. Um, I mean, when I hear Hurling play, I hear that. New Orleans swing, I, when I hear Shannon, when I hear Roger Paul and Tolkienowski, people like that, Richard Moten, you know, Chris Severin, people, I mean, man, I'm like, shh, that stuff you can't buy, boy. That stuff you can't buy, you gotta earn that something, of God. You know, and it's because we all grew up drinking Mississippi water, Mississippi River water, and just being submerged in this groove rather than some note thing. Yeah, we all want to play fast, and, we, you know, we all want to do that. And we do. But boy, still, when it comes down to the, you know, we still got the meters and people like that, you know, in our whole concept. Paul Barberin and Louis Armstrong quite naturally. And, you know, a lot of us didn't get to hear, like King Oliver, a lot of Freddie Kepper, some of the early trumpet players. I did do some investigating where I heard a lot of that stuff. But um, when, you, you know, like on this um, soundtrack that I was doing with Branford, um, we did this song from King Oliver, it's called Deep Henderson. And like when you hear that song, you can hear 
all the big bands that came after that, mm -hmm. you know, in that song, okay, whether you get credit for it or not, I'm, I'm finished trying to get credit for stuff. I just want to live till, you know, and play the best music I know. Mm -hmm. All that credit and stuff like that. But boy, when you hear that Deep Henderson, it's like shh, you hear Jimmy Lunsford and, you know, all of those bands that came after, it was after King Oliver was in Chicago and he had Louis Armstrong playing second trumpet. And man, boy, those guys played like a unit, you know? They really played like a unit. Like, it was kind of the beginning of written arrangements and, you know, of that kind of, of that sort. There had been a lot of um, society music written down and stuff like that. But, you know, after, after say, Jelly Roll Morton, that, that concept started to move that way. I mean, um, so you could hear that tune being so influential. Well, not only that tune, but a lot of King Oliver's band being influential in music that came after, after that. So, uh, that's what makes New Orleans so important to me. Because it was it was the beginning of so many so many things and you know yeah just and that, you know after the Louis Armstrong era in in the sixties mm -hmm. like the kind of New Orleans funk came in you know like something you got baby. Ba -ba -bo, but make me work all day. You know, these kinds of things that became like in uh, all of those things are going around in us every day or should be because it makes you an individual. We can all get the book and get the thesaurus and get the uh, omnibus of all, just, you know and all play the same stuff over and over and, you know, just never bring anything to the table, just regurgitate with, with what was in that book or something, you know, like that. But, man, having all of those melodies at your disposal, just, it's like, so every tune um, becomes an individual tune, and every time you play it, you play it differently, but you still play it. You know, like when you hear Miles Davis playing, like, uh, but not for me, or something like that. He, um, they were trying to play to me, just to me, in more of a, like a New Orleans swing concept, you know, just. You know, and just spelling those the two fives and stuff like that. It's like instead of some skateboard, you know, and it's like, eh, you know, but. When somebody's spitting sassy stuff like that, it gets like, hmm, that's what gives you your individuality, you know? And I don't, I don't know, maybe. That's the way I think of it. Anyway, but, and I mean, you've been to many classes, you know, where I was, I'm pretty consistent with that, man. Learn that melody, you know? Just, and learn to say what the melody is saying. Learn to say what the words are saying. They're writing songs of love, but not for me. It's fast, but it's the blues. You know? A lucky star is above, but what? Not for me. You know? And then it's like, so it's a broken-hearted thing, even though it's, you can play that song again 100 miles an hour. Still, the words are going to tell you it's still, but not for me, man. You know, and we don't have people that listen to stuff like that anymore. You know, not not conceptually, 
to hear the words or they can read the words and they can even sing the words, but does that really mean anything to you individually? And that's what I'm mostly about, being an individual, you know, because I never give people stuff to always tell them work on the blues, work on your two fives, man. Because that's going to put character in your playing, you know? And I don't know, that's just kind of the way I look at it, you know? <clears throat> um, I was actually wondering if you could maybe play a little bit, just uh, maybe even that tune, but not for me, just play like a, the melody and then play a chorus of, you know, something that is kind of based on the melody. Yeah. All right. You want that, but not for me? You want yeah, that? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. That's what melodic concept is about. Restating the, the melody your way, if you have a way, you know? So, I don't know. And that's what I think, like, developing an artist's personal rendition and enhancement of certain songs is about, to me. But, you know, everybody, because, you know, I, I told that you know, a few years, I had some really great, great guys that I heard developing and becoming real, real, some of the great guys in the world now, you know, and it was, so another title of being lucky to be around this certain set of musicians and um and then maybe they were a little lucky to be around me to tell them these things rather than go and get a book and you know do this and i loved rayfield mendez mm -hmm. i think he's the greatest trumpet player i think he's the absolute greatest but i don't know anybody who could do that you know but he wasn't this improvisational artist. He could take that paper and see the whole thing seems like at the same time. I don't know how he did it. But, you know, when I think about jazz trumpet, I don't think about playing the horn like that, like his perpetual motion or Mexican hat dance and stuff like that, you know? Um, I'm going to think of it, what's coming out of your heart? And that's just the way I think of it. You know, develop that heart, man, and, and the respect from those melodies. And because 
you retain a song like that, not for me, but you know, we got a lot of songs like, you know, bit bop, ba da ba do ba bit, ba da ba 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 da ba 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 ba, and it's something difficult to read, and it's in twelve ninety nine time, and you know, all of these kinds of, you know what I mean? You don't retain that. You don't retain it. It's challenging, very challenging. But when you got a tune like "But Not for Me," that, that son of a gun it should, it deserves to be in forever, man. It's almost like that, you know. But even like in the '60s, like like um. You know, you can still play the blues in, inside of that, mm -hmm. you know, but we got a lot of uh, energy in, in music and stuff like that now, and that's great energy, but we got another saying in New Orleans, it's not what you play, it's what you say. If you're not saying anything, you just, you know, because, okay, you got your high notes and what, you know. And I don't know. I just, that's, I'm just a big fan of developing. What, what do you have to say on this, too? I would love to hear it. You know, not what did, what did Shaw say or Freddie Hubbard say or, you know, what did that Frenchian scale say? What you got to say on that? It's just me. It's just um. I've been lucky to have a great career. I've been very, very lucky. Mm -hmm. But I played music that pleases people. I think that's why I've had a fifty-year career. We can go on all, all our scales and have three years or two years of touring, man, what, oh, the, you know, so-and-so, and I've been those places too. And um, then the horns under the bed because you couldn't sustain your entertainment value. And we've got all these sayings about, you know, man, you shouldn't be playing for applause. All of that is kind of Johnny-come-lately um, sayings. But my dad used to have this saying. If they don't have butts on seats out there, they don't need your butt up here. You know? Better attract some people and entertain them. Make them feel good. That's our job. We're in a service industry. We got some really great things we've done. I believe the King, Queen's presidents. Yeah. But still in a service capacity. Because we're there to serve them. We're there to please those guys. They'd have to see us, of course. We've got to, you know, we're doing what we do too, but we better serve them, keep them coming back to see us. Because, mm -hmm. and, you know, what happens in a lot of today's thing, you get the publicist and they tell you, you know, this guy just flew in from the moon on a, on a you know, a pigeon or something. And, you know, he can walk on water and play the trumpet at the same time and stuff like that. And they got all these publicized things. And then when you land, you know what I mean? That you, that they're not pumping the air under your wings. And when you land, or you anywhere? That's where you determine if you've got a career or you're just a kind of flash in the pan type of person. Mm -hmm. People don't know what it is. I mean... I've been very lucky in my career, but my allegiance has been to playing songs and developing a concept that would please people rather than, you know, hey, look at me. And it was about... Um, 
eight years ago or something like that. I did a couple of tours with Benny Ghost and you know who he is, a tenor player. And he was just so like, he, he was an old man. He still could play, still could play so much. And he wrote the song, I remember Clifford. And when we started out, he was featured on that. And um, one day he was a little late to re rehearsal. We were with a Spanish big band then. And um, <clears throat> he came in there. I was, I said, so I, said, I just started rehearsing the band. And we did that, I remember Clifford. And he stood at the back of the auditorium and he was saying, man, this is your tune now, man. You know, he, he said, you know, Lee Morgan was the first one to record it. He started telling me the whole history of that tune, you know? And it was just so unnerving. I mean, to play that song in the presence of him, um, many years ago, I did a recording with Bob Haggard playing, and I was playing What's New on the flugelhorn. Just bass and, and, and flugelhorn. And uh, Matt Dahmer, the guy who had, um, did a record company in Sarasota, Florida. Anyway, he's got that somewhere. I don't think the record ever came on, but that, that was like unnerving, man. And I'm not unnerving because I can't play the song. It's unnerving to be in the presence of, with the respect that you got. You're playing a jazz standard with the guy who wrote the damn thing. You know, that's. That's something, huh? To me, that is something. Because he's, and he was like, man, at the end of that, he's, man, you sounded like Clifford Brown on that thing. And I was like, Shh, man, I wish I did sound like Clifford Brown. <laughs> but I had learned it from Clifford Brown with strings, so I understood what he was saying. But um, it was just such an honor to be around these kind of people, man. You know, Dick Hyman and, you know, it's just like, boy, man, that's, oh boy, I don't know who deserves to be where, but I felt very lucky to be around all of the guys I've been around. It's been a wonderful career and just um, a wonderful life. Um, just make the best of it, you know. Um, made a living playing the trumpet. That's what few people can say. It's, in, it's a country day and private schools and Tulane and all of that kind of stuff. Playing the trumpet. Playing the trumpet. You know, um, I've been very lucky. I tried to just do my job, entertain people and just um, make them happy, make it worth the price of the ticket. Well, I think we're about out of time here, but um, do you have any last words that you'd like to, words of advice for young musicians? Yeah. Um, like I said earlier in this uh, interview, Des Gillespie told me, Keep one foot in the future, keep one foot in the blues, because your blues is different from every other person's blues on earth. So that's gonna make you an individual, an artistic individual. And um, you're gonna get all that other stuff. But get your blues together, man. Get your two fives together. Just learn to spell and spit like that, man. You know? and I've got plenty of stuff on YouTube and stuff like that with me with different trumpet players. And it's just like they did their thing. I did my thing. But when I came in there, you knew it was me. I had my individual concept and way that I played and respect for the melody and, you know, at foot in the blues, all of those kinds of things, because that doesn't always transfer. A lot of times, um, 
as teachers, you know, I taught at UNO for a few years. And um, you want to give them the best advantage. And one, one reason they discontinued my class, they told me, they said, well, Mr. Brutius, you don't teach out of a book. This is why they discontinued me. And I was like, uh, what I know is not in a book, babe. What I know, I'm giving them my heart, not my book. But still, they got somebody to replace me, and pretty soon, this guy was inviting people outside, <laughs> you know, to fight and stuff like that. You know, it's just because teaching can be a very thankless job. But boy, you know, you've been in these classes with me, man. I'm, I try to be so positive and like, man, you better get this together, bro, because this, this is what's going to make you a career, not this song, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about your career. So getting those two, five, learning melodies, because so many people, like a young lady said to me one time, Mr. Brunus, um, could you get me a gig? She was about 15 or 16. So I said, I said yeah. I said, well, okay, uh, we're on the gig. What's your first tune? Uh, then it became a deer in the headlights. You know? um, um, well, you know that uh, you know that thing you did with uh, Jonathan Baptiste on, uh, it was on YouTube? Yeah. I learned that, I learned your solo on that. She had no idea one melody, you know? So I said, okay, well, okay, you got that. What's your second tune? No idea. So you got to go to, you know, and I don't mean with the real book with this folks bottom, I can read 1,500 tunes. I don't mean that. I'm talking about learning some tunes with respect and respect for the melody and stuff like that. Get those things together. You're going to have a career. Not, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, that's mostly what I can say. Um, just being around people like Lionel Hampton and Chet Baker, and I watched these guys. These guys knew melodies and respected the music. You know, Benny Gosen. I mean, he just, it was fun. Um, learn you some melodies, young people. You're going to love yourself and your artistry. Hmm. Wow. Thank you so much. That's really good. Thanks, advice. Emily. Thank you, baby. Yeah. I, I, hope, I hope we get out of this thing pretty soon. Uh, boy, I don't think people are paying attention to what they have to do to really get past this mm -hmm. COVID thing. But, um, um, just is boring me to death, man, to be this inactive, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I hope we get together soon, babe. Very nice to see you. Yeah. Thank you for the call. God bless. Nice okay. to see you. Have a good day. Thanks, baby.